Hello, I am Carlos Garcia Roledo. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. And welcome to the symposium, Dead by Adolescent Cuts, Insect Declines in the Anthropocene. This is a symposium where we are celebrating the little things that run the world, but also we are gonna discuss why they are declining. So just a reminder, you may submit questions to the speakers at any time during the presentations, but please be sure to do so using the Zoom question and answer button at the bottom of your screen and not the question function in WOBA. Uh, please indicate which speaker you are uh, asking the question to. Now, uh, I want to introduce the speakers of this uh, symposium, and it is really special because we're gonna have first Dave Wagner talking about the general processes generating extinctions and declines of insects with his talk, uh, Anthropogenic Assaults on Darwinian Endless Forms and Synoptic of Global Insect Declines. The Dr. Wagner is a professor at University of Connecticut. And after this, we're gonna have uh, an empirical study by Daniel Salcido at University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, her talk is titled, Long-Term Trends in Interaction Diversity in a Tropical Lowland and Tropical Highland Forest. And after that, we're gonna have a second empirical study by me, Carlos Garcia Roledo. And the short title for my presentation is Stop Hitting Your Study Organisms, okay? And finally, we're gonna have live uh, Dan Jansen and Winnie Holbos, who are gonna talk about a dozen cuts to Costa Rican insect declines. Please be kind to the survivors. So everybody, welcome. And thank you so much for joining our symposium. Hi all, uh, thanks for attending my talk. And I wanted to thank the conference organizers, but especially Carlos Garcia Robledo for organizing the symposium. I only have 10 minutes to discuss global insect decline. So let's see if I can get to my slides and get started. One of the most important questions is whether or not global insect decline is real. I know that there's been some studies talking about no, no decline or increasing abundance of insects. But the weight of the evidence is, is clear that insects are declining. It can't be otherwise, actually. If we just didn't have any data at all, we could just go back to first principles. And you know, we have 7.8 billion people on the planet. We know that birds are declining and mammals are declining, plants are declining, corals are declining, insects are declining. We, we know that. Um, but there are still program officers at NSF that call it apparent decline and, and reviewers as well. But that's a matter for another day. I think Durzo pretty much had it right back in 2014 with his paper in Science Defoundation in the Anthropocene. He found a 45% decline in insect abundance across 16 data sets. Admittedly, almost all the data came from Europe, uh, Northern and Western Europe. But this 45% decline happened over 40 years, so basically a 1% decline. There were findings earlier um, for moths in, in Britain that had this rate, and recently Van Klink and a, a very rigorous meta-analysis reported a 1% decline for terrestrial insects, but actually increasing numbers for, for aquatics. Um, I'm just gonna talk about one study or anchor sort of our thinking or basically your foundation or touchstone. Maybe uh, this would be a great study for sure at all. It came out in January this year, looked at Western butterflies from the Rockies all the way over to the Pacific. And what's really nice about the study is it included agricultural areas, urbanized areas, but also wildlands. And we have corroboration across three data sets, which I think is enormously important or um, empowering. So the, the three data sets were Art Shapiro's data from the Bay Area all the way up to the Sierra Nevada. It was 10 butterfly sites, and he's been surveying these by himself for, for, 10, for 40 years at this point. And then there's another data set that they had, the North American butterfly count data, basically Fourth of July counts that are analogous to the Christmas bird counts, but this time we're doing bugs and it's summer. And the, so they had over 70 sites where they had more than 10 years of data, but some of the data sets went back more than 30 years. And then the iNaturalist data from just the last 15 years. But the, the plots and the declines are of the same magnitude for all three data sets collected by different individuals, analyzed separately, but they tell the same story. 
to drive that point home even more, there were about 260 species of butterflies where they had data across all three data sets. And they were able to show very similar patterns of decline across the different data sets for many of these 260 species. So this would be Shapiro's data, this would be the NABA data, the 4th of July count, and this would be the iNaturalist data. This is just one example. This is Vanessa Annabella, the West Coast lady, a common easily recognized nymphalid. So the bottom line in their study was that uh, butterflies were declining, not just at 1%, but 1.6% uh, for these 260 species where they had a lot of data. And um, a couple points here that are really important. I can't emphasize enough how important a 1% decline is. 1% decline over four decades, over 40 years, with 1% uh, decline would equate to a loss of one third of your insect individuals, one third of your biomass, one third of your bird food, one third of your pollination services. We can't do this. We can't allow this to happen. We have to, to slow uh, this decline in, in any way that we can. Uh, second point is this 1.6% is an average, right? So many species are declining much faster than 1.6% and some may actually be increasing or at least declining much more slowly. The West Coast lady and monarch are two of the species in the forest at all study uh, that uh, appear to be in really bad shape, uh, crashing. So what's happening in the tropics? Well, unfortunately, we you know, this is a tropical meeting and that's what I should be emphasizing, but there's not a lot of data from the tropics, time series data, data that extends back many decades. Most of that comes from Europe where we've had insect collectors for, for hundreds of years. And certainly we can go back, some of these data sets go back um, a half century or a century, especially for po popular groups like moths and butterflies. Less data from the North America, from Canada and the US, very little data from the Neotropics, at least in this uh, review done by Sanchez Bio and Wikis. The clarion call for what might be happening in the tropics actually came from Jansen Howex in 2019. Early in the year, they had a perspective in biological conservation and they reported a massive faunal changes over the 40 years that they've been in Santa Rosa and ACG um, all across, uh, across the, the tree of life. I mean, the, the paper was anchor, anchored to Lepidoptera, especially caterpillars and their parasitoids and, and the moths that they were getting at their lights, but it actually extended to many other insect groups and talked about declines uh, and faunal, alarming faunal differences over the course of their 40 years in Costa Rica. And then from the other side of the Cordillera, you have um, Lee Dyer's studies anchored to La Selva. This is a lowland tropical uh, Atlantic uh, rainforest. And they saw declines of caterpillar numbers over the 20 years of their study uh, across all groups. So no, no winners here uh, whatsoever, at least when looking at the subfamily level. So uh, quite, quite alarming and, and Danny Salcido will have uh, more details about this study in, in her talk. I, I put this in as an example of increasing caterpillar numbers. This is another Lee Dyer site, this in Beza, Ecuador, East Slope, about 6,000 feet at, in a cloud forest, at least it was a cloud forest at the beginning of the study, often miserable weather, wet, uh, there you go days without seeing the sun. Now that's changed a lot in 20 years where these clouds are higher up on the mountains and, um, and many days we're seeing uh, sun and uh, many more days of sun, which has translated into increased insect numbers or caterpillar numbers in this case. But we should expect insects to be increasing in certain places, right? So um, any place where temperatures were limiting in the past, uh, those conditions should be ameliorating. So in Finland, Sweden, Iceland, Greenland, Canada, we should expect some small increases in insect diversity and abundance. Where we do restoration ecology, we see increases in insects, um, not both in diversity and abundance. So it's not all bad, but it's, it's really bad uh, in, in general um, uh, across large swaths of the planet. And um, uh, it's very foreboding what might be happening in the tropics. In terms of the threats, uh, there's nothing that's surprising here. So these are the threats that you would predict. The yeah, same threat, the same threats that it, that are tearing at the tapestry of life, the, the tree of life uh, for, for, for birds, for, for mammals, for reptiles and amphibians are those that 
I believe to be the primary threats for insects, habitat loss and degradation, but especially tropical deforestation, agricultural intensification. We still have to add two, or predicted to add two billion people to this planet. Um, that spells doom for many of the forests um, of, the, of the planet and it makes me very sad. Now for all my life, uh, these were the, the primary stressors for biodiversity. But now I think climate change is, is certainly their equal and I fear will soon overtake agricultural intensification and habitat loss as a primary stressor for biodiversity. Um, very worrying. And then of course there's special insect uh, stressors, pesticides, uh, insecticides primarily, but also herbicides that eliminate food plants. You're gonna hear more about light pollution in the decades ahead. I'm out of time. Uh, I, I, there are some important things we need to know. We, we need more data from the tropics. The details matter. These declines are spatially and temporally quite heterogeneous. We, we want to know what the rates of decline are in wildlands, where perhaps climate change is the, the singular driver, as opposed to anthroscapes uh, near agriculture and near cities and what have you. But we know enough to act now. Nature is under siege, and uh, anything that all of us can do to, to slow this, uh, now's the time. And I think with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and um, end my talk. So thank you very much, and maybe we'll have more time in the discussion. Thanks to the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation for organizing this conference and the organizers of this panel for the invitation to present among such an impressive panel of many researchers I admire. My PhD focuses on changes in interaction diversity across gradients of time, space, and climate change. Illustrated in these images is our lab's focal system, including caterpillars and their insect parasitoids. The importance of tropical biodiversity does not escape this group, and we are all well aware of the many global change parameters that are impacting and threatening these systems. For this talk, I'll be focusing on the effects of climate change, particularly extreme precipitation events, which often lead to flooding events in tropical lowlands. Increases in extreme weather events will likely have complex and large effects on lowland tropical insect communities, including changes in phenology, distributions, and species interactions. One example includes multivoltanism observed in pest insects. In addition, local extinctions and time lags caused by extreme weather events will likely co compound climate-driven changes. Here we focus on climate change effects on interaction diversity among assemblages of plant caterpillars and their insect parasitoids. While redundancy in ecosystem function conferred from high interaction diversity is expected to render communities more stable to changes, tropical species are a part of highly specialized trophic interactions, which render these habitat or diet specialists vulnerable to changes in climate and associated changes in host abundances, phenology, and distribution. La Selva Biological Research Station is a well-studied lowland tropical wet forest in Costa Rica. It's located on the Caribbean slope of the Cordillera Central. It's one of many sites in our long-term rearing projects, and these are pictured in dark gray. While research from this site has existed for, uh, since 1991, for the purposes of the study, we use 22 years of sufficient continuous data of host parasitoid interactions generated with the help of Earthwatch citizen scientists. After observing an increase in extreme precipitation events across the study period, here measured as the frequency of precipitation events exceeding 2.5 standard deviations above the annual mean, we were interested in the possible effects on caterpillar parasitoid interaction diversity. Following the predictions of Starman et al. 2005, we predicted that increases in extreme precipitation would result in the reduction of an important ecosystem service biocontrol by parasitoids. Starman showed that more variable precipitation, shown on the x-axis, was associated with reductions in parasitism on the y-axis, and that this relationship became stronger when considering parasitism by specialist parasitoids. Two of these points on the graph include the sites I'll be discussing today, Nyanayaku and La Selva. 
Across the 22-year sampling period, we found a decline in both parasitoid diversity, here shown in yellow, and caterpillar diversity, here shown in blue. Estimates of the slope coefficients represented an approximate 9.5% decline in caterpillar species per hectare each year, and around 15% decline in parasitoid species per hectare each year. Using the first five years of the data to estimate a baseline diversity using a Chow estimator, losses represented an estimated 38.8% reduction in caterpillar richness. The network pictured is a summary web of higher level taxa. And the existing webs at the species level are much more reticulate than shown here. To understand long-term patterns among caterpillar hosts, we examined the frequency of encounter for 64 caterpillar genera, for which we had the most data using Bayesian hierarchical linear models. Caterpillar genera are represented on the y-axis, and their changes in frequency over time are represented on the x-axis. Points represent the mean annual trend from a posterior distribution with their 80% credible intervals. As a more intuitive measure of decline, on the second x or y axis, the numbers represent the probability of decline for that genera. For example, Xylophanes has a 99% probability of being in decline, which is to say 99% of the mass of the Bayesian posterior distributions were less than zero for year coefficients in the regressions. Out of the 64 genera you see here, 41% or 26 of them have at least an 80% probability of being in decline. In a few cases, some genera increased in frequency and species within this genera are known to have been outbreak species or agricultural pests in tropical regions. We used structural equation modeling to test causal hypotheses that evaluated the effect of climate on taxonomic and interaction richness. The best fit models provide support for the inference that declines in richness are caused by climate anomalies, specifically increases in precipitation and temperature anomalies. Factored into this model is interaction richness, but I have omitted it from the path diagram to simplify for presentation purposes. Here, blunted lines represent negative associations and arrows represent positive associations among variables. The size of the line indicates the magnitude of the path coefficient. Temperature anomalies had a large negative effect on all levels of richness, and precipitation anomalies had a more subtle negative effect on caterpillar richness. Time acts as a latent variable and captures unmeasured factors changing over time. The largest path coefficient was represented by the link between time and both measures of richness, indicating the effect of unmeasured variables changing across time, perhaps land use change and pesticide use. The most parsimonious models excluded small associations among precipitation anomalies and parasitoid richness. We also examined the effects of central tendencies and found that minimum temperature was an important variable. Accounting for the negative relationship between flooding events and minimum temperatures, which is to say flooding events are associated with decreases in the minimum temperature, the effect of precipitation anomalies on caterpillar richness has a 2.5 fold increase. Losses in interaction diversity were concomitant with the reduction in parasitism. The beta coefficient for parasitism events across the years represents a decline in parasitism of 3% per decade or 6.6% decline during the study period. Following predictions in Starman et al. 2005, reductions in parasitism were greatest among hymenoptera parasitoids represented here in blue with little change in parasitism by dipterans in green. We also tested causal hypotheses that the precipitation anomalies and their time lag led to reductions in parasitism, and we found strong fits for that model. Precipitation anomalies are increasing across time, and the effects of lags decrease across time. Both precipitation anomalies and their one-year time lag are negatively associated with percent parasitism.
We've begun to ask if these results are generalizable to other taxa and regions. For a tropical montane forest in the Napo province of Ecuador, we examine long-term trends in caterpillar abundance across the, an 18-year data set. Unlike the tropical lowland sites in Costa Rica, which I have shown strong evidence for the decline in caterpillar abundance, caterpillar abundance in the tropical montane site did not exhibit a similar decline. And here the y-axis represents log abundance. Here we show site level differences in the response of caterpillar taxa at a very coarse scale. We see not all tropical caterpillar taxa respond similarly across sites, and at this very coarse resolution, there provides some evidence that larger macromoths are doing more poorly than other superfamilies. To summarize, we are losing interactions and ecosystem functioning at a fragmented site in the tropical lowlands. However, this is not the case in a less fragmented tropical montane region we've studied. And we have shown that responses or losses can vary by taxa. Earthwatch has been central to this aim. When we consider the overwhelming information we do not know about the tropics, organized volunteer efforts by programs like Earthwatch really provide a model for how tropical research can advance and unknown links can be captured. With that, I'd like to acknowledge Earthwatch Institute, the Experiment Campaign, and the National Science Foundation for funding the hundreds of Earthwatch volunteers I worked with and the amazing lab group of which I'm a part. Well, thank you so much for joining our symposium on insect declines. As we learned in our previous talk, uh, insects are threatened by many different factors. And for my talk, I'm gonna focus on one that is uh, habitat loss through climate change. So here we have a representation of a tropical mountain in different ecosystems. And with an increase of temperature between three to six Celsius degrees, this is what is gonna happen. A shift of ecosystems uphill, we are gonna have in the lowlands new temperatures, and we're gonna have a reduction or even the high elevation ecosystems might disappear. And here we have the paper that inspired most of the research on this topic, why mountain passes are higher in the tropics by our next speaker, Dan Jensen. And the idea is that tropical organisms are inhabit uh, habitats that are stable over time, and they are locally adapted to those uh, really constant conditions. And that suggests that maybe tropical organisms are uh, more threatened by global warming than temperate organisms. And in many studies, it is assumed that it is possible to understand the responses of those organisms by performing really quick and simple physiological uh, studies of quick responses to extreme temperatures. And I'm gonna give you an example of one of the, this kind of research from my own laboratory. So here is a study where we found that tropical organisms, tropical insects uh, at different elevations have different thermal tolerances. So for example, low elevation insects have higher upper thermal limits and high elevation in insect species have low thermal tolerance. But I want you to look at the numbers of those upper thermal limits. They can go from 37 to 46 Celsius degrees. And of course, this is not realistic. We all know that the temperature at which an insect faints is not fitness. And that's gonna be a topic of this presentation, where we're gonna discuss how physiological estimates of thermal tolerance are not enough to answer this key question if we want to understand um, insect declines through climate change. At which temperature? Which temperature will insect population dynamics shift from population growth? To population decline because we need to remember that insect declines is a demographic process. So stop hitting your study organism. That's what I told myself and I'm going to show you the different approaches in my laboratory to actually estimate fitness of these organisms under projected global warming. So I'm going to show you some data from one of our study sites. It is the Selva Biological Station 
in Costa Rica and the Bravo Carrillo National Park. This is an amazing place. This is the highest elevation gradient of continuous forest in Central America that goes from La Selva, biological station in the tropical rainforest, up to 2,800 meters above sea level. And along this elevation gradient are the study organisms I have been working with for the last 12 years. These are plants from the order Zingebroelis, the banana-like plants that include the bananas, the gingers, and so on, and they're insect herbivores, the Cephalea beetles. So this is one of the oldest and most conservative plant herbivore interactions known so far. This can be between 40 to 60 million years old, and it is becoming an emerging model system to understand plant herbivore interactions in the tropics under predicted global warming. So the Cephalea beetles are also known as the rolling beetles because the adults and larvae feed inside the scroll formed by the young leaves of their host plants. So if you unfurl one of those young leaves in the neotropics, this is what you will see. You will see multiple beetle species inhabiting that raw leaf. When the leaf matures, the beetles have to fly and then they have to search for another host plant where they will start their life cycle. So these are some of the beetle species that we work with in our laboratory. And we have really good records on the elevation of distribution of all these beetle species, their host plants, and also their diets, who is what? By using DNA barcodes, by extracting the DNA from the gut contents and then understanding which are the host plants of each one of, the, of these different species. But what we're gonna talk about today is in how to measure fitness. So here we have the fundamental equation of life history that is the, the, the kernel equation for every single demographic model. And the fundamental equation of life history, what it says is that if you know how long do you live, LX, and how many times do you reproduce, MX, then you can estimate fitness. And fitness in this equation is, as you see in red, little r. And here is little r, right? So who is little r? Little r is the instantaneous population growth rate. And this is a really important parameter because it's the parameter that links ecology and evolution. Little r is fitness in an environment. So how do you measure fitness? So what you do is that you can estimate fitness by having cohorts of insects in the laboratory. In this case, you have a cohort of six individuals that you start raising as larvae in the laboratory. And you follow the schedule of, of birth and death in the laboratory of those individuals. And then what you obtain is the survivorship function. So how long do they live, this LX? And then after they start reproducing, you have to follow the schedule of birth of the descendants of that cohort. And that curve of fecundity for each individual represents the fecundity curve. This is MX. And if you combine LX with MX, you're able to estimate little r, that is fitness. But you need to remember that fitness always happens in the context of an environment. In this case, it is going to be different temperatures. So here is our laboratory at La Selva. And each single box uh, has a beetle, an adult beetle, larvae, eggs, and so on. And we bring them from, uh, from this laboratory to our laboratory where we have incubators, where we are simulating climate change along this elevation gradient to measure fitness at different temperatures. So here we have the elevation of distribution of the beetle species known for the La Selva barba transect. And for this talk, I'm gonna focus only on one species. This is Cephalolea belti, that is the, the roll beetle species that we know that has the broadest elevation of distribution in this genus. And what is interesting is that we discovered that we can, uh, this species has different mitochondrial haplotypes and actually, these haplotypes are distributed along the elevational gradient, and you can trace the distribution of these different haplotypes, these mitochondrial haplotypes. And we have that in the lowlands, we have a particular haplotype that is typical of the lowlands. And in the high elevation habitats, we have hybridization zones, and then we have on top of the mountain, uh, uh, only the high elevation pure mitochondrial haplotype. And we need to underline here that this is not a case of incipient of cryptic species, because actually these beetles can mate and produce viable hybrids. Okay, so our high and low elevation haplotypes adapted to local temperatures. So for this, we just raised a F1s of pure high elevation and low elevation haplotypes at temperature that represent the different ranges of temperature that they, the species experiences along this tropical mountain from 10 Celsius degrees to 30 Celsius degrees. And the result of this is that they are locally adapted. Larval stages, adult stages, and fecundities 
are adapted to particular temperatures. The high elevation haplotype is adapted to temperatures between 15 and 20 Celsius degrees, and population will only grow between those temperatures. But the low elevation haplotype is adapted to hotter temperatures. And cohorts of these insects can only survive at temperatures between 20 and 25 Celsius degrees. So are hybrids adapted to current temperatures? So for this, what we did was to raise these hybrids in the laboratory, and we have two hypotheses. We have one hypothesis that we call the hot mitochondria hypothesis that proposes that thermal tolerance in, is inherited through the mitochondrial genome. And if that's the case, then we expect that when we have hybrids with the mitochondria inherited from mothers from high elevation, those hybrids will be able to survive at cold temperatures. But if the hybrids inherit the mitochondria from low elevation mothers, we expect them to be able to only survive at low elevation temperatures. Then we have a second uh, hypothesis that is the maladaptive genomic decoupling hypothesis that proposes that when you decouple the mitochondria from the nuclear genome, then uh, the different life stages of these insects will be maladapted uh, to different te to certain temperatures. And then the result will be that either they won't be able to survive at extreme temperatures, or maybe only in the hybridization zone when you have intermediate temperatures, or maybe at none of the different elevations. So for this, we perform this experiment. We obtain high elevation and low elevation uh, individuals, and then we obtain a hybrid F1 where we obtained mitochondria from the female, and then we have a mix of high elevation and low elevation nuclear genome for these hybrids. And we raise them at temperatures between 15 and 25 Celsius degrees. They are the temperatures at which we know that they can uh, survive. So after this, we estimate, for example, a larval survival. And in this case, we see that larva, larvae of these hybrids can only survive, survive the best at 20 Celsius degrees, that is the temperature at mid elevation. Adult longevity occurs at temperatures typical of mid elevation, but also at cold temperatures uh, on top of the mountain. And then fecundity is higher at high temperatures. So what we have here is that the different life stages and the different vital rates are decoupled. And then you have that they are adapted to different temperatures. So well, something that we recently published in my laboratory is a method where we can actually connect those empirical fitness estimates in the laboratory with environmental temperatures. And for this, what we're doing is that we're using a long-term data set. So this is a data set on temperatures collected every half an hour for 40 years along different elevations, along this elevation gradient. And then we can actually estimate uh, the fitness that we can expect for these different haplotypes and hybrids along this elevation gradient. And the general result is this. So if we model a fitness of these organisms at current temperatures, we actually obtain the same result of the distribution of those uh, of these different haplotypes along the mountain. So we have uh, the fitness estimates predict that low elevation haplotype will be present at low elevation and middle elevation, where it will be also present and potentially hybridized with the high elevation haplotype and high elevation haplotypes can only be pre uh, are the only one that are present at highest elevation. And what we did was to perform these simulations, uh, increasing temperature in the temperature data set. And the result is this. Basically, if you increase temperature by two Celsius degrees, all these different populations will decline. OK, so in conclusion, the mountain pathos hypothesis predicts that temperature stability along tropical mountains promotes local adaptation and speciation. Mountain passes are even higher in the tropics than we previously thought. Not only species, but populations are adapted to temperatures along tropical mountains. And mountain passes are especially high in hybridization zones. And hybrid seems to be maladapted. And an increase in temperature of just two Celsius degrees will trigger demographic attrition, pushing species and population boundaries to the limits of tropical mountain passes. Thank you very much.
All right, so now that we finished the three presentation of our symposium, now we're gonna have Jan Jansen and Winnie Holbrook live from Philadelphia, I think, on their way to Costa Rica. So please go ahead and welcome Dan and Winnie. Thank you. Okay, now. Good morning or a good middle of the day, wherever you are. We, um, Winnie and I are talking to you from Philadelphia at the moment, like migrant birds. We've gone to the north and we will be going back to Costa Rica um, in just a few days. Now, this talk will be a little different than our usual talks are. We have tried to write it out so that it could be easily read or understood by anybody, uh, no matter what is your mother's language. To begin with, I'm 82 and Wendy is 66. You all today are where we were in 1985. That's 30 plus years ago. We briefly sketch our trajectory since then, thinking it might be useful to you as tropical biologists. We are tropical ecologists, but this panel story, the topic of this panel starts for us during an environmental impact assessment in 1985, when 1,500 placer gold miners had invaded Costa Rica's national park. We learned that the miners felt quite justified in the context of their frontier society because unoccupied and unused forest was up for grabs. Soon after, I stood in a dining room of fancy tableware in the UN relating the wonders of our tropical biology research, just like you all are today. I suddenly realized that if we kept on with full blast research, we would produce a huge amount more of academic literature, but then turn around and the subjects will be all gone. My dissertation research ecosystem in Veracruz, Mexico had survived 5,000 years of relatively, gen relatively gentle indig indigenous hunting farming. It's now an enormous industrial sugarcane agriculture. In 1985, we stepped out of academia with one foot into the pragmatics of keeping tropical biodiversity alive by rendering it part of its societies. Winnie and I have been superficially studying and living in a tropical insect refugee camp since the 1960s. We are tropical insectometers, if you like. We are not testing hypotheses. We are close up observing the grim realities on which to base solutions for the rescue of the wild inhabitants from their lethal current circumstances. When the house is on fire, we do not need a thermometer. We need a fire department, hospitals, insurance, fire codes, and all the other social things that come with it. The only real hope we feel for tropical wild biodiversity is to be accepted by its own tropical societies. Our personal focal animals are caterpillars, their parasites, and their food. The observational teams are malaise traps, light traps, 170 kilometer square conservation area and its 150 staff members and the search and care by about 30 Costa Rican resident parataxonomists. They are finding and rearing 10,000 species of caterpillars in forests that contain as many species in three hectares as are in a third of Europe. That's 35,000 species to date. These efforts are variously integrated with a diverse array of national and international collaborators. Everyone is involved, taxonomists, conservationists, government administrators, molecular explorers, industrial biodevelopers, private and government funders, and 5 million Costa Rican citizens and their governments. You can do tropical economy, ecology solely for your academic payday or you can design them to favor the bugs and trees at the same time. That's what we do. 
The national effort is called BioAlpha, which is really just Spanish for bioliteracy for an entire country. It's aimed at social acceptance of Costa Rica's millions terrestrial species of multicellular species through everyone being able to know what they are, what they do, where they are, what they offer, and on the web in the public domain. The as yet unexplored microbes are free riders, dependents, and essential parts of that. We help to welcome them all to society's negotiation table. They need to be found, understood, DNA barcoded for recognition by anyone, anytime, anywhere. The results after 36 years and innumerable national and international collaborations, the intense evolution of a classical guns, gold badges, 200 square kilometers national park into becoming Área de Conservación Guanacaste in Northwestern Costa Rica. ACG is now spreading nationally through a friendly government. It's eight times larger than its original and sustainably developed as a hacienda that delivers social goods and services while it allows its formal wild occupants to restore themselves. It had been a ranch for 400 years before that. This is massive social restoration and conservation of at least 650,000 multicellular species. Those are wiggled among at least a million species of Costa Rican terrestrial wild residents still surviving throughout the country's 50,000 square kilometers. This biodiversity, all of it, biomonitors, biodegrades, bioprospects, bioeducates, biotourists, bioirrigates, biocreates, and biorepairs. It's what evolutionarily created us. Insects are glue, structure, regulators, nodes, food of the language of the wild throughout the country and the world. They are now taking a massive hit from omnipresent impacts, no matter how gentle you are with the originals. In June, we have just lived three years in an insect desert. The dry season I first met in 1963 in Costa Rica was four months long. It is now six months long. These impacts are quite different from the 400 years of frontier European style damage that ACJ suffered before it became a restoring national park in 1971. Biodiversity restoration from the surviving fragments is in full swing, but it can no longer achieve the original while enduring the rapid climate change scenario we are living. It will have to live with the ongoing extinctions in its badly wounded ecosystems now. Today's insect survivors and all that come with them are now tomorrow's colonists in their brave new world. Please be kind to them. Remember what the word kind means. You use the word mankind or humankind or womankind. What are you saying? You're saying that these things are humans. We need to be kind to them. We need to treat them as part of our world. So in conclusion, we were assigned by the symposium. The last section of the symposium will be a discussion on the challenges and actions needed to detect and mitigate global insect declines. To us and to many others, it's obvious that the house is on fire for all tropical biodiversity. It needs fewer thermometers and a lot more global and place-based preventions. Thank you. Excellent. That was great. Thank you so much, Dan and Winnie. So now we have a few minutes to answer some questions from the public. So I'm gonna go first to Wuba and then I have a few questions here. So I have a first question for, for Dave. Uh, the question is in Indonesia, insects are often associated with many diseases such as pests and disease, making them presence, uh, their presence is unwanted in many areas. This may happen in other tropical countries. What kind of effort that could be done uh, of effort 
that could be done to raise people's awareness that insects provide more benefits than uh, such bad things? Okay, David. Well, I'm not certain I can solve that, but I, I, I do know that people are starting to think that changing the culture, how we think about insects is a very important part of going forward and getting people interested in preserving insects. There's an awful lot of people in the world, uh, maybe especially those that are involved in forestry or agriculture that thinks the only good bug is a dead bug. And, and obviously our, our, um, our new foci on pollinators and pollination is, is starting to reverse that. But really, uh, uh, fundamentally, if we want people to think about insects and, and care for them and, and, and use money and dollars and time and, and to educate them, it has to come from a, a cultural shift about how we value these insects. And like you say, balance the, the good insects with the bad insects. I think a lot of that starts with education and a lot of that starts with us in terms of being better ambassadors uh, ab about conveying the importance of insects. But but also education, um, particularly with younger people and in schools. I think, you know, if we started with education now in just 10 years, a, a lot of the younger kids would have a different mindset. And, and we do see a, a radically different mindset about insect diversity across the planet. In Japan, uh, insects are deeply loved. It's in their art and their poetry. Uh, you buy these insects in the stores, department stores. You rear them, you rear them, you go to expos. In, in the United States, uh, if you carry a net around and talk about insects at a cocktail party, um, they think you're some kind of new, you know, nut from California or something like that. So the, a, a big part of what's going on all over the world uh, is, is actually changing our culture about, about insects. And, it, and that comes, I think, from the actions that we take and, and uh, the, how we behave as ambassadors and what we do with our education systems. Excellent, Dave. All right, so we have another question for Daniel. So did you consider the behavior of the insects, whether they are shade or sun loving species when you analyze your data? Thanks. Uh, no, we didn't look at uh, the shade versus, we didn't separate it out by that um, categorical variable. Excellent. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to other questions. So here we have a question from Frederick Gebert to all the panelists. If we continue business as usual, and you had to give a prediction on which insect orders are most likely to, to drastically decline or to go extinct in the next century, which are the most likely to survive? Which, which orders or group of insects you think will be the survivors? So maybe we can start, who wants to start this, Daniel? Well, I could say a little bit about the ecology. So where we've looked at, where we looked at traits that are associated with different lineages, the one that jumps out in the most studies showing insect decline are specialists. Ecological specialists are crashing faster. And that's not to say that some generalists aren't in trouble too, um, but, but in general, um, these things that, Maybe temperate taxa are, are probably going to do better because they, they, they deal with enormous temperature swings, more so than uh, tropical insects. Uh, maybe, maybe some of our insects, 50 degree swing in, in one day is possible. Uh, and so they, they, you know, a two degree difference in, in centigrade may not be as important to some of our temperate insects. Um, so I, I don't really know it on a, on a lineage basis, but our, our the, the traits that we see over and over again are, are large insects are declining uh, faster than small insects. We have uh, specialists, uh, especially host plant specialists, but you could imagine uh, other, other axes such as uh, these things that need nutrient poor ecosystems or low competition are also gonna be stressed. Um, I, I, I would like to reinforce what Dave just said. Um, The word specialist in our world tends to relate to two different things. One is parasites per se, and the other is things that feed on plants, which of course are parasites also, but they're thought of as two different sets. 
And what we're seeing very clearly is that the parasites, as in traditional parasitoids, flies and hymenoptera, uh, are clearly declining uh, much more rapidly than are the, the leaf eaters. And the other side of that coin is that um, uh, they are also extremely specialized so that they don't shift from one host to another host in a closely related or within the same genus of hosts. They say put on the one they're on and that gets this pairs, then they go down. However, what we're also finding is that after 10 years or five years or 15 years of not seeing somebody, you think they're really gone. Then you turn around and there's one individual. So what we're dealing with in our world is a lot of seemingly almost surviving populations but not easily found by anybody. And nobody studies those. When you get off the plane in the tropics and you have six months or two years to do your research, you don't look for the rarest insect to do it on. You look for the one that's common at that time. So we have a very, very distorted view from all of our tropical research of the tropics because all these individual papers, thousands of them and in individual studies are conducted on insects at the time when they are abundant. And when you live amongst them for year after year after year after year, you begin to realize that for 20 years, there can be one year in which they're extraordinarily abundant and other years in which they simply are almost gone. We see this with mammals. We see this with birds. Certainly you can see it with plants if you imagine that the seedlings are plants as well. And certainly we see it with insects. The other thing with respect to um, uh, the question directed to uh, Daniela, excuse me, Danielle, is that we are watching our monitors, our malaise traps and light traps and these sorts of things very carefully. And there is a huge difference between forest understory and forest edge. And most tropical biology is done on forest edges. So if you focus on the really deep shade stuff, you have a quite different viewpoint than if you focus on the stuff that's easy access for humans, roadsides, edges of fields, places that people are already working, all that kind of thing. So I'll just add that to the overall situation that we're living with in the tropics. All right, speakers, anybody else wants to contribute to this uh, question or shall I move to the next one? Okay, I'm gonna move to the next question. So this one is a question from anonymous attendee. So that's interesting. So how do we escape the tendency to prioritize insects that benefit us? For example, pollinators and not to fall into the charismatic microfauna trap. We don't fall into it. We sample everything. A malaise trap catches what is willing to fly into it. Obviously, it does not pick up what's in the litter, but it gets a lot of flying things. And when I said there are 35,000 species in three square kilometers, that's everything. That's 5,500 species of Cecilia myid flies, almost none of which can be identified by any other way than by barcoding. But it is also true that funding sources are not willing to pay. Funding sources pour into the microbiome of human beings, the health of human beings. When we are um, trying to get money, it's relatively easy to get money for barcodes of trafficked animals, of health-related animals, but of the vast diversity that's out there, it hasn't caught on. We need somebody to, to light a spark so that the funders view this as incredibly important. Conservation has always had this problem about you know, where the dollars come from and, and the focus. And I would argue that we have so little time left that we should take the money wherever we get it and start even when it is the charismatic tax. I, I mean, a lot of money for the pollinators across the United States actually came when they listed or proposed to list the monarch butterfly in the United States. Uh, once that butterfly 
uh, was proposed as being listed for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Endangered Species, millions of dollars opened up, not just for the monarch, you don't put all that money in the monarch, but uh, for pollinators. And, and I think that's catalyzed the whole change in mindset and funding sources. And right now, um, we should take we should take the, the money that we can get for pollinators and use that to protect habitat and um, identify stressors uh, to take action, to, to do outreach and education. And, and we take the money where we can get it, uh, but, but conservation has always had poster, poster children and flagship taxa uh, uh, driving things and, and getting people a large spectrum of the public behind the effort. Excellent. Anybody well, else? Wants to... a... Sorry, please go ahead. Oh, go ahead. What I was referring to when I said design your research so that it covers both what we expect from our academic community and what the public sector expects, that requires that you look very carefully at what the public sector wants and desires. What is their currency? not our currency in academia. And in the tropics, the social currency is very different than it is in the United States and Europe. So ironically, this is an association of tropical biology and conservation meeting. But the tropical part of that sentence gets left out when thinking about where does our academic activity fit? in Colombia, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in Costa Rica, in Mexico. What do those audiences care about? And this concept of charismatic species, which is a very, very Northern one, is something that holds very little currency on the streets of a poor, starving country. You're muted. You're, mu you're muted, Carlos. Everybody, thank you for letting me know. I was really trying to not do that, but all, I always do it. I want to say thank you very much to all the participants. And I want to also say thanks to the Zoom tech expert in Vitesi, and also especially to Ivan Ortiz, who put together everything that is happening right now behind the scenes. So before we say bye, I want to thank everybody and please remember that you can still submit your questions through WUVA uh, and all the, mem all the members of this symposium will just answer you back. So thank you very much and please be kind to the survivors. <laughs>